Okay. Good evening, everyone. Buff Dyke could come inside for sure. <laughs> so I'll try to uh, wrap us up fairly quickly so that you're going to get out and at least enjoy a little bit of a nice warm weather later on. Um, so we're beginning module two, uh, our data and design modules. So we're done with module one, information literacy. Hopefully that is sunk in enough for you to uh, have a good idea on how you're going to write your paper. This module is all about the fundamentals of data from, we're going to look at aspects of data types. We're going to look at aspects of cleansing data. And we'll do a little bit of manipulation with data. We'll do a little bit um, this tonight and next week on formula writing and things, just basic stuff like that um, for reinforcing some of our data cleansing and data manipulation topics. So this is the layout for the remainder of the semester. We are really moving along pretty quickly here. So the, uh, the assignment that you're going to be working on, so we're going to talk about the data stuff first tonight, and we'll talk about it a little bit next week. The assignment that you're going to get will be assigned next week. So Tonight's sort of a lay the foundation kind of night. You'll get an assignment next week. That'll be due the following week. And then roughly we'll have you know, two more, three, three more assignments, five, six, and seven. They'll all be data related kinds of assignments. And I think I talked about it last time a little bit and I'll talk about it more next week. Uh, you'll essentially do the assignment and then answer some questions about it. We'll have our final I don't want to call it the final exam, but we'll have our second of two um, on the, the assign the 27th. That'll be due by May 4th. Give you plenty of time to work on that. And that will not be inclusive of anything in the module one. It'll all be module two. It'll all be data related. And then obviously your final will be due by noon on May 15th. So a um, little bit of time, but yet we're rolling along pretty quickly here. So let's take a look at. Uh, module two um, in, the, in, the, in the work that we're going to do tonight. There's a lot of material in here. And like I said, I'm going to try to get you out of here, not hold you to too much past eight, I wouldn't think. Um, but what we're going to try to do in here is again, lay the foundation. We're going to talk about data types in Excel. We're going to talk about Moore's law. I think I mentioned it once already, very important topic. Moore's law is one of those uh, axioms that gets used a lot and um, it really is, a, it's, it may not be perfectly accurate anymore, but its concept is very accurate. And it's, its concept is very uh, applicable to any kind of technology, rather, whether it be when Gordon Moore first came out with it back in the 60s to when uh, we're talking about uh, advancements in technology now. Um, back then, uh, Moore's Law was all about uh, semiconductors and really it was the semiconductor that really led the led the way for compute. I mean, without that, we don't have compute. So um, now we have a lot more. We just kind of take a lot of that stuff for granted. But the the axioms that he came up with in in that Moore's law is, is still again very applicable today. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Microsoft Excel because we're going to use that beginning next week, and I want to kind of um, I think I have yeah I have instructions and I think that link still works because sometimes those links move around ah uh, it's not so the, the, the uh, so IT did move that around alright I'll fix that link um, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to use Excel for some of our data manipulation and cleaning exercises. If you've got it, and I'm going to do a little bit of a demonstration tonight. If you've got it installed on your PC, great, you're all set, or your Mac, you're all set. If you don't, then I'll, I'll put that link out on, um, on the website, on, on our um, week eight link. But basically, you have to go through the steps, and I'm going to go through the real quick here. I'm going to show you. You have to go through the steps to download Office to your local machine. Now, if you don't have, it won't download to Chromebook. 
or any of the netbooks, which are sort of the, uh, they're more internet based than they are, um, than they are PC based. So it won't apply to a Chromebook. If you have a Chromebook, you'll have to use one of the university computers that has Excel on it. It will definitely have it loaded on it. So if you logged into any one of the university computers in any one of the libraries, you'll have Excel on there. The reason why I'm saying that is because we're gonna use some features of Excel that don't typically come with the stripped down version. So you'll get a stripped down version of it in online. So Microsoft Office 365 online, you can use Excel, but it doesn't have some of the more advanced capabilities that we're going to use. All right, and just give you that heads up right now because it won't, you will, you will, the, the instructions won't make sense. It'll say, click on this, click on that, choose this from menu, and it won't be that way if you're using the online version of Excel. So you're going to want to download it if you've got a desktop or a laptop or a Mac. Uh, download it, and I'm going to kind of show you the link here in a second. It changes up a little bit, um, but I will also fix that ITS link as well. So I want to do that tonight just to get you um, thinking about that and preparing for it when we start doing assignments. Assignment five, six, and seven will actually be Excel-based assignments. Uh, let's see, what else? Then I'll do a, uh, a demonstration on the Excel stuff probably after our break. Um, and then there's a couple of links towards the end here. Like these last three links, I probably will not go over those. You can look at those. Uh, outside of class. It talks about how data science uh, is fighting coronavirus. Now, this was a real uh, big topic back in the fall. It still kind of is, because uh, we still don't have everything that we need to know about that in um, preparing for how to deal with it when it does mutate. But this, these articles go on to show how uh, the gathering of data, and that is so, so important. That's why you know, the more, the more we can do in terms of disclosure of information and data within reason, the more we're going to learn about um, the attributes of this, um, of something like coronavirus. And then we can begin to study it. We can then begin to uh, put a model, a digital model together to kind of understand it. In industry, it's very common, um, and I'll just talk about this as a sidetrack for a second because it's a real good informatics topic. Um, you'll hear big, big companies and middle-sized companies as well talk about having digital twins. Digital twin. Has anybody ever heard the term digital twin? No? No digital twins? Yes? No? Okay, good. All right, so the digital twin in companies like GE were kind of the first to, to kind of get into the digital twin. The digital twin, let's take a... Um, well, let's just take a jet engine, for instance. The way big companies that manufacture those actually, as computers and computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing got to be more advanced and our computers got to be faster, we could literally build the specifications of the parts for all of these jet engines on a computer. So computer-aided design, CAD, anybody ever play with a CAD package? Maybe in high school, in computer? Yeah, CAD, okay, computer-aided design. You basically, you can build parts and you can give the parts attributes. So let's say we'll pull this part out of the, uh, out of the toolbox and it's a piece of metal. And the piece of metal is shaped with a certain diameter, a certain thickness, um, and it's got a particular uh, property to it because it's made out of a certain metal. So we know something about that. We could drill holes in it. Maybe we could expand it. I mean, all the cool things you can do digitally. So you could morph that into something that resembles a part that you need. Well, fast forward to doing all of that kind of thing for a jet engine, assembling the thing together, and then simulate its, its run. So now you can literally build that jet engine on a computer and never have to try to manufacture it and make all the mistakes that you would make during the manufacturing process. You make those mistakes 
and you make those design changes on the computer first, get that thing, no matter what it is, to be the way you want it to be, the way you've designed it to be. And now you've got a perfect specification that you can go build. That's what a digital twin is. Such a, uh, a big improvement in manufacturing and such a big improvement in, uh, in, in just making anything, period. And that's you know, pretty much the way all things are made now. Um, digitally first. So we design it, we test it, and then we build it. So that way we're not scrapping materials because we've made it wrong or finding out that this material doesn't work because it's not strong enough and wasting all that time and money on it. And time is the big thing these days, and time and money on materials and people. So now we can design it, test it, stress it the way we want, make sure it's going to work, and then we can go build it. That's a digital twin. Well, same thing with a, a living uh, organism like a coronavirus where the more data that's understood about this and the more our uh, re research and scientific community knows about it, they can build models of it. So they can build a digital twin of it and then let that digital twin sort of run and see what happens to it. Okay, so we can't do that unless we understand it. So the more data that we get, long story short, circling around on the data side, the more data that we can get, the more understanding of it we can have and then we can build a digital twin of it. And that literally is sort of the way you use computers and data and analytics to improve a product or a service or an understanding or one of the ways that Moderna was actually, that's kind of how they thought. It. They sort of knew how this thing operated and they had the technology to tweak their model and then watch and observe how it works. And Moderna was one of the companies, maybe, maybe Pfizer did too, but I know Moderna did do that. They used computers to sort of figure out what this thing was, how it acted, and how to combat it, how to stop it. And then they used that information to then begin their, their technology. That's why a lot of scientists think that Moderna, or maybe scientists, but there are those in the community who think that the approach Moderna takes for these kinds of things is more applicable for not just this particular uh, coronavirus, but for other things as well, just because of their approach to using data to design, to understand the thing and then model the thing and then watch the thing uh, operate. So very, very cool. Digital twins are um, all the rage. Most big companies do that now because they can do it. Um, the technology is actually really good and fairly cheap that uh, pretty much anybody could, could do it. AutoCAD's a pretty good tool. Um, you could, so if a light manufacturer could easily use something like AutoCAD to build a product and then build and test that product before it actually gets manufactured. All right, so it does a lot of things for a business. It, it cuts down cycle time. It reduces waste. It allows you to be very close to being 100% sure that your product's going to work before you actually invest it, put money into building. So good stuff, really great stuff. And again, all related to data and analytics and the whole informatics field. So those three um, at the end, um, and then using analytics for the, the, the last one there, how or can you predict how the virus, coronavirus spreads? Well, yeah, you can. The more data you've got, and the more data points that you've got, you can kind of predict where it's going to go. And that's, that's sort of how uh, there were all the predictions, you know, last year as to what the infection rates were going to be and the death rates and things like that. So they use the data to, to model and use the models to run and predict the future. So great stuff in, uh, in informatics uh, to be able to do that. So that's why it's important for us to understand data at you know, a very um, non-threatening way. A lot of times when we, we study data or, or we study any one particular technology, we seem to we sometimes jump right into that technology without really understanding the We're really understanding the um, the fundamentals behind it, and that's you know, you, uh, to me, I like to see the big picture and I know the fundamentals before I can build upon something more complex and then use all those fundamentals to build something more complex. So we're going to look here at this PDF out on the um, on the lecture material. So what are data types? Well. Data types quite simply are 
representations of information that follow a particular rule or pattern. For instance, a numeric data type. Well, what does it mean to be a numeric data type? Well, it means that you're zero through nine, that you're a number, all right? And you can have numbers to the right of the decimal point, you can have numbers to the left of the decimal point, but you're a number, you're a numeric, you're not text. You can't put an A in with a nine in a, well, you could if you're a hexadecimal, but that's a different story altogether. Um, but you're, you're typically not co-mingling text with numbers. If you do that, then you're an alphanumeric, okay? an alphanumeric or a combination, which more, which generically falls into this first category of text. Okay, text, text in any kind of computer software is we can basically put text into, so what we're looking at right here on the screen is text. So text could be A through Z, um, point, decimal, slash, question mark, star, pound, all of those things, in addition, in addition to numbers. The text will hold practically any character that we can see. Now, a non-printable character is not, it can be treated as text at the software level, but it's typically not text that we work with. The only non-printables that we would work with would be like the space or the carriage return line feed that we don't typically see in a document. But if you were to go into Word and turn on show all characters, it's in the options. I can't remember exactly which panel in, but you could see all the non-printable characters like the space, carriage return, line feed, which breaks our lines, paragraph marks, tab marks, things like that. Those are non-printable characters. And we typically don't deal with those in text. However, we can, in software, manage them. So we can read all of the characters up until we hit the carriage return. Well, now that indicates to us that that's a new line. So all of the characters we've read up to that point, we're not going to read. You have a question in the back? Okay. Uh, we're not going to read that character, that carriage return. We're just going to know that when we hit it, that we've hit the end of the line. So text would be all of the things that we could basically see. A through Z, capital, lowercase a through Z, zero through nine, period, slash, dot, uh, semi, colon, all of those kinds of things. Numbers, and again, in, sometimes you're going to hear them called alpha, alphanumeric. Well, alphanumeric just describes that text can have some numbers in it, basically. But it is text at the end of the day. Numbers, okay, so zero through nine. The thing that kind of differentiates or adds to numbers is that the numbers can have formats to them. So we can have things like an integer. What is, what is an integer? An integer is a number zero through 32,632, 64,500. Those are integers. Those are numbers. Uh, one's a long int. Uh, but that's another. Um, and then we can have decimals. Okay. So those are all considered numbers. We can have fractions in there, 0.25, not one slash four, but 0.25. Percentages, 0 0.10 for 10%. Currency, so our number could represent what ends up being currency. So we could format these numbers, but the point being here is they're not gonna have A through Z in them. They're not going to have a question mark in them. They're not going to have a um, pound sign. And well, Excel sometimes shows a pound sign, but it's not a pound sign. It's just saying it can't represent the data. But um, it's not going to have A through Z, basically, upper and lower case. Not going to have anything other than a zero through nine in it. And they may have decimal points in it. All right, so numbers, dates, and times. So dates and times. So dates and times are very interesting data types in that if we were to talk about a number, the only thing that we might want to do with a number would be to add it, subtract it, divide it, maybe move it to a different cell. But with dates and times, not only is important that we have, that we can handle numbers in there, but it's also important that we 
we can handle or we or the software knows what is a valid date all right so january 33rd is not a valid date all right so you know and the same thing with um any other date that's just not valid so dates are a very interesting kind of data type in that not only do we store numbers and letters in those you can most dates and times have to be validated so in excel you can give excel a date and it will do its best to try to figure out what that date so you could enter some numbers in there and say hey this is a date all right and it'll do its best to try to figure out now excel may try to format it a different way so you could format it with uh, in this case the four digit year dash, it looks like uh, 0707, so it's uh, probably July 7th. Um, and then the time after, 123256. Or you can also say July 7th, 2003. All right, so we can store dates and times as well. And the same thing with a time. When we hit 60, the next increment of that number is either the increment of a, of a second to a minute or a minute to an hour. All right, and hours have 24. Right. So dates and times are very special kinds of data type. Not only do they need to be able to handle uh, the date, but they also need to validate the date. So we, we would put numbers and we would put um, so we could format that pretty much any way we want it, but it has to be valid, all right? If you put an invalid data in there, Excel will tell you that, and per practically every other software will tell you that, okay? We can't put garbage dates in them. Right? So they're, they're called out as this very specific kind of data type. The next type of data is called, what's called a logical value, okay? Logical meaning true or false on or off you may hear it on or off true or false zero or one sometimes represented that way and it's in a, in a logical so if if a data type is logical it can only hold two types of data a true or false a zero or one a yes or a no again in excel we can format a logical value but the point being is it can't hold a logical value can't hold 10 or 13 or ABCD it holds true or false okay, so there's 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 um, reasons why we need that all right in analytics and in informatics there's reasons why I'll take a um, uh, just a, a very basic Example, we have, a, we have some software, let's say, and we're entering some data into that. Let's say we're entering data into a form. Well, we would, if there's certain data that we have to have in order to make this entry, this data entry accurate or complete, we may say the field is required or the data is required. All right. In most analytics and informatics have the logical attribute of required or not required so when it's either required or it's not required right. we can also say that um, there's, a, there's a lot a lot of use cases for logical values but we could also say that the um, the value so when it gets stored on a, on a database somewhere it either has to have a value or it doesn't and we would tell the software that make sure there's a value here. Don't store it otherwise. All right. So the logical required is equal to true. Right? So true and false. All right. So those are the major, again, text is a very, very big bucket of, of um, characters. We're going to sort of focus on the data types that you use in Excel because that's the tool we're going to use. But you'll, you may hear the term alphanumeric as well, which is text, but it's basically telling you a little bit more 
about that text field, and that is it can hold numbers and characters. Right? If it's numeric, it's numeric. If it's date time, it's date time. If it's a logical value, it's a logical value. So those are some of the basics of data types. Now, Excel or any software would not be complete without being able to do stuff with those data types, like manipulate them, like create formulas. All right, so if you've ever used Excel, you know that one way that we can create a formula is we enter first the equal sign. So equal sign, and then we can create our own very simple formula. In this case, the, uh, the contents in step three here are, I have a value sitting in the sale, and I have a value in the overhead. Now, what the example is showing here is I also have another data field called profit. Right. And what that is not showing is there's more to that cell where uh, it says equals B2. So basically what we can do here in a cell is we can reference another cell by saying equals in the name of that cell. So what this formula is beginning to do is it's beginning to say, okay, in profit, I want to start by calculating B2. Now there's two more parts to this. So how would we finish this off? If we wanted to calculate profit, how would we, how would we finish it off? Sales minus overhead. So what we can do in that profit field is say equals B2, which happens to be the cell that is highlighted in dotted blue, minus B3. All right. Now I'm going to show Excel in a second. What is, a, what is A, B, C, D? What do the numbers 1, 2, 3 mean? Well, in Excel, across the top of an Excel worksheet, which we're going to see in a second, are all of the letters. So A through depending on, your, on the memory of your computer, you could be up to be double B or um, triple C or, or quadruple D, depending on uh, how much memory and how far. Typically, if you have a 64-bit machine with a fair amount of memory, you can have Excel calculate way, 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 way out, um, thousands of cells. So across the top are our letters, A, B, C, D. We're only gonna do, we'll probably maybe get, maybe get to Z. Um, Chances are probably we won't have that many columns of information out there. And then down vertically, up and down vertically, are the numbers. Right? So on, a, on an Excel workbook, okay, I'm going to show you that in a second, A1 is the very, very first cell in a workbook. Why? Because it's column A, row 1, the very, very first cell in an Excel workbook. Right? So... These are the kinds of things we will do over the next few weeks. We'll have some data in rows and columns. We'll do some basic cell manipulations. We'll do some formulas and we'll get results. We'll let Excel do the calculations for us. All right. And we'll explore, I think that very first thing, assignment five actually has you doing some exploration of how does data actually get cleansed? What are some of the things we do to cleanse data? Because it's very, very common that when you're doing anything in analytics or informatics, you're going to get data from other sources. So it's going to come from maybe other computer systems. It may come from data entry. You're going to see on your assignment five how you can create a form, put some data in the form, and the form will actually be saved. And the data will be saved behind the form in a Excel-like workbook. It's actually going to be a Google form um, and it's Google Sheets behind the form, but essentially it's Excel pretty much. Right? So you can download that form.
form. I don't think you're going to have to. The data will already be created for you, but um, that way you can use that data to do calculations and manipulate, which is what we're going to do. All right. So here's the step four, as we like I just talked about, our subtract manipulation formula. There, the profit is equal to the B2 minus B3, so it's equal to the 120 minus 100. And then the result is simply just hit the enter key. And we're going to, again, see more of that um, in a little while. Now, one of the other nice features about Excel is if you type right into an Excel cell, rectangular little cell, that what you're typing in there actually appears in what's called the formula bar at the top of Excel. All right, that's a nice, nice feature to have. All right, so you can always either edit right in the cell, and depending on the length of the formula, if the formula is long and there's a lot to it, you may just go and edit it right in the formula bar at the top of Excel, which is nice to have as well. Now, we won't use these for the first assignment, I don't think. Oh, we might. We might use one. Um, but one of the, the most, um, most used, strongest features of Excel are all of the, what are called built-in functions. Okay, so Excel has hundreds of what are called built-in functions. And what that does is it simplifies operations. So in a case like, I just want to sum up some numbers instead of saying, okay, let's do, um, in the total column, we're going to do, and I'm going to make, make these numbers up. So January is in column B. So that's this first cell, the first column is A, that first row is 1. So the first number is in column A, B, B2. So instead of saying B2 plus C2 plus uh, D2 plus E2 plus F2 plus G2, et cetera, et cetera, I can just say I want you to sum the values across the range of cells. So you type the equals, the word sum, open parentheses on step three. And what that tells Excel is, hey, you want to put some numbers, you want to put some values in there. Then you take your mouse, you start on the first number that you want to sum, you drag it across, Excel builds out that formula that you see there, you let go of your mouse, and you close the parentheses, closing parentheses, and you hit enter. And then Excel builds that formula for you and calculates the sum of those values. We'll use formulas, some basic formulas, over the next few weeks to manipulate some data and we'll, we'll also manipulate some data using, um, we'll actually cleanse some data, manipulate data by cleansing it um, as well with some of these other functions. Right, so after you do that formula, press enter, you get the result. Now, I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to actually talk about all of these. When you're getting into some of the more sophisticated data types. I'm not really too concerned right now that um, we're going to get into these. But when I said earlier that the numbers, the numbers at the very top here, could be made up of a lot of different kinds of numbers, this is what I meant by that. So an integer number would be a number between 32,760. Uh, uh, 8 in minus 32,768 and 32,767, a long integer, is a much, much bigger integer, ranging negative to positive. Then we've got single precision number with, with uh, six decimal points. Again, I'm not going to, to test you on these, but what I want you to realize is that numbers do have subcategories or subtypes, if you will, that give us the ability to be very precise with how we want to calculate. Now, why is that important? Well, if we were doing a, uh, let's see, we were doing a calculation on a 
on an instrument, let's say, like a, a meter or a scale or um, and we were measuring liquids, let's say, that had to go into a like, like vaccine, um, like vaccines. We will probably find that the integer data type isn't precise enough. All right, so if we needed something to be 5.00012 grams, an integer is not going to be precise enough. Or we need to we need to bore we need to we need to drill a hole in the casing. We need to drill four holes in the casings of the jet engine in order to be able to bolt it in there. And those those bolts have to be 2.5 centimeters, not two, not three, but 2.5 then integers won't work for us. We've got to come up with a different data type. We have to use a different data type. So there we would use a double or uh, a decimal. If we wanted, if we were doing finance application and we needed numbers, we needed dollars, we're going to use currency as the data type. All right, so just, these are just subtypes of, uh, subtypes of, of numbers. All right, and the reason why I, I kind of wanted to start with the number topic first is because they're all numbers. Numbers is a big category, but then there are subtypes of those numbers because we may need different kinds of precisions, different, different uses to these values. If you're doing a account of a bunch of values, you don't need a decimal for that, all right, or a, 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 a double precision. You just need an integer for that, and just counting up numbers. If you're doing an average, or a standard deviation or something like that, you would need a decimal. Right? So there's different uses of these numbers uh, from, depending on the application that we're doing. Now there are other data types that I didn't highlight here. Uh, we're not, we're not gonna do anything with those. Bytes, objects, and variants, we're not gonna do anything with those. Those are all kind of programming, basically programming constructs that get you to be able to manipulate at the computer memory level these values, right? we're not gonna do anything with those, but those do exist. Questions on, on that? So understanding that at a very high level in terms of the big picture around what these things are and why we're gonna use them um, is important because once you understand the big picture, it becomes a lot easier for you to then begin applying this stuff. So we'll use those data types there. Um, the nice thing about Excel, and the one thing that Excel has done pretty well over the years is it's allowed you to change these data types. So you can sort of mix between these data types by just changing their format versus you having to do any extra special work. So we could take a number two, which is an integer, and then go up and put a format of decimals on it. Well, now we've just changed it to a decimal. All right, so the formatting within Excel provides an easy way for you to get or, or move among those different data types. All right, so it's another strong feature of, of Excel, and it's a very strong feature of most software packages that allow you to make the conversions between these different data types. And I just, I throw that out there only because we may see formatting of data, you know, and it'll change its type, it'll change its look uh, from one thing to the next. All right, again, it's more or less formatting, and, and, it, and Excel's just giving you an easy click way of changing, changing the format of the, of the number or the data type. All right, questions on that pretty straightforward, hopefully. All right. So next, what I want to do, um, I want to talk about Moore's Law next. And I think there's a video in here for me. There is. And I believe both, all three of these videos should work. Um, some of these links have broken in the past, but hopefully um, at least some of them on earlier this semester have broken, but we'll see if this works. So let's, let's take a look at Moore's Law um, right now. In 
1965, when mainframe computers were just beginning to use integrated circuits, Gordon E. Moore published an article in Electronics Magazine in which he predicted a very bright future for the computing industry. By tracking the evolution of integrated circuits to date, Moore predicted that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit would continue to grow exponentially. This observation became known as Moore's Law. The method I was trying to get across was that integrated circuits were the road to less expensive electronics. It really evolved from being a measure of what goes on in the industry to something that more or less drives the industry. If you compare the first microprocessor, Intel's 4004, to today's 14 nanometer processor, performance is now 3,500 times higher. Energy efficiency is improved 90,000 times, and the price per transistor has fallen by over 60,000 times. If automotive technology had progressed at the same rate, cars would go almost 300,000 miles per hour, get over 2 million miles per gallon, and cost only 4 cents. No other technology that I can identify has made progress at that rate, nor has any had such a profound effect on society throughout the world. And certainly in 1965, I would not have predicted the kind of products we make today. They're spectacular. Moore's law has driven Intel and the industry to make the impossible possible and to completely transform computing to create amazing experiences. The potential is there for this change to continue, and I'm continually amazed at where things have begun. Just remember, whatever has been done can be outdone. All right, so that is, uh, so what I had said earlier is that uh, that axiom, if you will, is true today. And granted, um, it's more, it's, we talk about now, so you could literally use the metaphor of Moore's Law in practically any technology circle and pretty much everybody will understand what you're talking about. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another example of a Moore's Law-ish kind of um, example. Um, well, obviously we've been able to miniaturize these chips to make them fit on um, our phones and get multitude, orders of magnitude more compute. But I'll use another example where we've Moore's Law-ished technology. Um, virtualization. Has anybody ever heard the term virtualization? Virtualization, back, you have, in the back, okay, cool. So, has anybody ever used a, a VM to connect into the university's computer system? a VM, a virtual machine, or a VDI. All right, cool. So you've used virtualization. So what virtualization has done is basically take what used to be a one-for-one -one computer for an application and basically turn that on its head by saying, we're going to put another layer of software on this hardware called a virtualization hypervisor. And with it, we're going to be able to share that hardware out such that we can slice up that machine into virtual machines so that now one physical machine can look like it's hundreds of machines. So literally, when you connect it to that VM, it was probably connected to by 100 people or 200 people at the time, and it was one computer. All right, so virtualization. VMware happens to be one of the leaders in virtualization. Microsoft also with their Hyper-V product. Okay, basically it's the computer. You're depending on, and I'll use just two scenarios. One is your computer hardware. Okay, so your machine that's shut off it's just hardware it's just chips and circuits and wires and stuff then there's the operating system we load on there so mac windows linux and then on top of that we load the hypervisor it's the hypervisor that we actually connect to and it creates a machine for us so it looks like we've got another computer that we're working on and it's all ours well 
it's not all yours. You're sharing that same computer with a hundred other people use through that VM hypervisor. All right. So what did we do? We were able to then give away websites for free. You can create a website for free or you can create a website for $9.99 a month or $5.99 a month. Why? Because in the old days you needed a computer, a web server, web software, and that was your website. Now we can put hundreds, if not thousands of websites on a machine using hypervisors, VMware, virtualization, the whole concept. So now every single one of those virtual machines can be its own website, its own web server. We can load all of the software that we would use normally to create a website and host the website, connect to the website on a virtual machine within that hypervisor. Right? So we've not only improved compute, we've driven down the cost. Okay, so there's an example of a, a Moore's Law-ish axiom applied to another piece of technology. Same thing, and, in, and it happens in subtle ways across all of our technology. It happens in subtle ways with the software, the apps that we get, the apps that we use subtly. They're more powerful, they're less expensive, in a lot of cases free, and the value that we get from them, the, the capabilities that you get from them um, are, are tremendous. So that, that is one, if you remember just that one axiom, just sort of the concept of what Moore's Law is, you'll get it. And that, again, it, it, people use it, and rightly so, as a, as a metaphor uh, across all technology because it, it actually does work there. All right, so let's go to the next measuring Moore's Law. So let's look at how we could go about measuring Moore's Law. Well, just to recap, Moore's Law states roughly that computing performance doubles every 18 months. This is doubling holding the cost of performance uh, constant. So in other words, if you have $1,000 to pay for a piece of computing, at that $1,000 you can get a roughly double the performance if you waited uh, 18 months and so on. Uh, Moore's law is not a natural law, it's not a physical law, it's a projection. It's a pattern that's been shown to hold true over many decades, um, and we're gonna examine that in a little bit more detail. So first of all, you know, we just looked at the definition. Well, what does that mean, right? So it doubles every 18 months. So just to kind of show some numbers, that would mean in 18 months, uh, we would have a doubling of performance. Three years, it'd be four times faster. 4.5 years, it'd be eight times faster. Six years, 16 times faster seven and a half years, 32 times faster, and nine years, we'd be looking at 64 times faster. All right, so just to see how that grows quite, quite quickly. Um, a good way to think about this is there's this old um, folklore in Chinese culture in which uh, somebody was, was owed a, uh, did a great service for the emperor, and as payment, the, the man requested that he would get a grain of rice for every square on the chessboard. All right, so that in the first square would be one grain of rice, second square two, third four, um, the fourth square eight, and, and so on. All right, so we would, we would see that. Um, and if we asked the question, well, how many grains of rice would be on the last square? All right, so that if on square one we had one grain, Square two, we had two grains. Square three, we had four grains. And we're asking the question, what about the last square? How many grains of rice would be on that last square? Well, we can examine that with this formula, right, where we have two and then an exponent of x minus one would equal the amount of grains of rice. Okay, so we could actually solve for that. Um, if I pull up the, cal uh, the calculator here, and I'm in Windows, so you could have, I'm actually on the Windows calculator under the scientific view. And we could calculate that by going two with the exponent here. And so since it's the x minus one, we could say 63 equals, and notice that that is a tremendously large number. It's very hard to even say, right? So if here we had uh, 
um, the millions, right? Uh, then we go into billions, trillions, quadrillions, and, and so forth, right? Um, so this is a massive number. This is a number that would start to parallel like the number of atoms that, that make up the earth. Uh, probably more grains of rice than uh, would be able to stack them on top of each other and reach past the moon. Um, it's an absolutely absurd number. So the idea here is it doesn't take all that many doublings to get to an astronomically large number. So let's bring this back to Moore's law and how this relates. All right, so what if we wanted to do something similar? We wanted to calculate, um, basically, if we assume Moore's law continues, we can assume that it assume that it's holding true, and we wanted to calculate how many years would it take to get a million, um, you know, million times the performance increase, right? A million times the performance increase, right? How many years would that take? And so we can apply a very similar formula here, where d here, right, to the d, is the number of doublings, and we look at that, you would equal a one million times um, performance increase, right? So D is the number of doublings, All right? Well, if we solve for that, we get D is almost um, 20, right? And I could get that, the way I would solve for that is if I go to this um, log base two calculator here, and I'm gonna zoom in. that we can see if I put in log of base two of one million, and I calculate that, it's almost 20, right? It's 19.93, so we're just gonna say 20, we're gonna round it a little bit, right? That's the number of doublings, right? So we're solving for D, and that gets us to about 20, and so we'd have to multiply that by 1.5 because we're, we're looking at Moore's law of doubling every 18 months, so 20 is the number of doublings, 1.5 years gets us to 30 years, right? That's pretty remarkable. Let's take a second just to think about this, that in a 30 year period of time, if Moore's law continued to hold true, um, that would be a 1 million times increase in computing performance. All right, let's ask a slightly different question. Um, what would the performance look like in the 10 year window? All right, so we're saying now I'm saying, all right, 10 years from now, if this continued to hold true, um, what would the computer performance look like? Well, first thing is let's figure out D, right? D is the number of doublings. And what we need to do in that case is we need to divide the years by 1.5 because we know that it takes uh, 18 months or a year and a half to double, right? To double performance. That's our assumption that we're working with here. So that'd be 6.67 um, doublings that would take place roughly in that 10 year window. Right, so we would say, we could use the formula we did before, which is two to the D um, equals P, and P in this case is our performance increase, right? Our, the amount of performance increase. All right, so if we go ahead and we do that, and I'll bring up a uh, calculator again. And then if we look at the calculator here, we can see that if we go two to the 6.67, that gets us to uh, almost 100, 101.8 um, times the performance increase, right? So we can see that um, in a period of 10 years, we would, we could, we're solving for P here, the performance increase is roughly 100 times, right? So pretty dramatic. Uh, so we'd see roughly 100 times the performance increase in a 10 year window, and roughly a million times the performance increase over a 30 year window. Right? So, uh, Moore's Law has been something that's been hold true for, for many, many decades. Um, industry uses it to help predict um, how fast they need to make new chips to keep pace with their competitors. Um, it's a very powerful phenomena um, that's really critical in understanding uh, computation from both a historical um, context as well as being able to use it as a lens to predict how things might change in the future. All right, thank you. Okay, so that gives you kind of a, uh, an anecdotal look at how Moore's Law is calculated. We're not going to need to do any calculations like that in here, um, but it just gives you an idea that um, 
yeah, we, we took Moore's law and we've sort of extrapolated it going forward. And if you believe in that axiom, well, that becomes like a mathematical formula and you can solve for it. Um, as Professor Muckle was saying in the video, companies did target what their performance needs to be based on that, that Moore's law calculation to know what they needed to do in order to reach a certain performance threshold. Now, it isn't in, in today's modern computers, the way they're built now, it isn't a matter of just doubling the speed at which the processor can work because there are actual physical limits to physical nature uh, limits in terms of how many, how fast we can push electrons down the, the, the tracers that are on our boards. And again, we're not going to, I'm not going to test you on any of that kind of stuff, but if you took a look at a, um, a board and I want to show you that in a second. So essentially what tracers are, are these little metal lines that we see on motherboards. Now those are all typically brass, copper, tin, zinc, a uh, combination of metals like that. So one of the reasons why we just cannot continue, and you can do more research on this if you're interested, um, is we cannot just continue to double the speed at which that processor can process because at some point they will, the processor will then exceed the, the rate at which electrons can actually move down the tracers to the next component that it needs to get to, whether it be memory, video, hard drive, or whatever, mouse, keyboard, whatever it is, um, because the CPU proliferates data on these things called buses, which is that, that's a picture of a bus. Um, so the processor itself cannot continue to double strictly by just increasing the speed at which the processor processes, okay? So we're kind of in a period at which we're sort of peaking, if you will, in terms of the entire computer processor. We can make the CPU do that, but then it doesn't do us any good because we can't, the CPU will have to wait around because it can't move physically the electrons down that fast enough to be able to utilize the capabilities of that CPU. So um, there are other things that are done inside the computer system to try to make that happen. One is you simplify the circuitry, simplify the chips, um, put in solid state. So you have fewer motors, you have fewer physical motors. Everything is solid state, meaning like a flash drive. Um, in there, you also um, store things on, well, silicon versus uh, magnet, magnetic hard drives and things like that. So, um, so I guess the point being is that, you know, we continue to use Moore's law, um, but we're sort of plateauing a little bit right now. There is, there's a whole new uh, um, realm or a whole new um, uh, phase of compute going on called quantum computing, which it's, it's totally different than this, um, which will get us back sort of on that doubling again. And actually may, some scientists think it'll actually be more than 1.5. It'll actually, um, double or actually less than 1.5 the compute capabilities will double in less than 1.5 uh, 18 months as, as the court in law but we're we're far away from getting quantum computing um, in the mainstream so for now we're dealing with you know manufacturers sort of making the processors a little bit faster and then doing things inside the computer systems more memory um, because at the end of the day we don't care what the cpu is doing we just want our stuff processed faster right we want our Excel spreadsheet to recalculate faster. We want our web page to show faster. We want our data to be pulled up faster. I mean, so to us, we don't care who does it, just make it faster, right? So that's sort of where manufacturers are um, at this point. So let's, do, let's take a 15 minute break. We'll come back. We'll begin um, looking at Excel and begin looking at some of our specific um, data type kinds of uh, exercises.
doing. Okay, there was uh, one other article that I wanted to kind of go over here, and it's called The Great Third Wave. That used to be a free uh, article where it wasn't behind a registration wall or a paywall or anything like that. There, there is a tool out there called outline.com, if anybody's ever heard of that before, which will kind of get beyond or get around some of these uh, walls. It should be a pretty straightforward and pretty easy um, article to read. And again, it used to be free. So why they decided to make it, um, but all you gotta do is register. So, to do. I don't know, maybe they are making it. But, um, so what, what you can do, and I have these directions in here, is use this outline.com tool to paste the URL for this into outline. It will actually get you the article. All right, so if I come over to outline.com, go over and copy and paste, so I'm going to control C, copy the URL, paste the URL in here, and click create outline. So it'll actually create this, um, the whole article will be So it's uh, fairly decent. Economist has always got some really good stuff in here, but it kind of, uh, kind of dovetails onto the, um, the Gordon Moore discussion. There were just a couple of points in here that I wanted to make. Uh, so here it refers to Gordon Moore. Under a rough rule of thumb known as Moore's Law, the number of transistors would be two on the tip of double or so. The exponential growth has resulted in even smaller, better, super fast electronic devices. Um, so it goes on to say that Moore's Law is now approaching its the end of its working life, and that's a very interesting choice of words. Um, end of its working life for that particular use case. Transist transistors have become so small that shrinking them any further will push up their cost and rather then rather reduce it. Why? Because we would need more expensive machinery in order to do it. So we would begin to get down at the atom level to be able to manipulate these circuits, which is sort of what quantum computing is about. 
good. Um, yeah, the point that what's the point in here that we want to make? Yeah, so the article goes on to um, on to say that this same kind of technology, the same kind of approach is going on to uh, improve other kinds of technology. So it goes on to talk about really uh, speed of driving these cars, you know, with the with Waymo. I want to talk about games. And then it talks about it gets into some of the economic side of things as well. Which, you know, go ahead, you guys, you can uh, read through that. I think it's very good information to really understand what what the compute uh, ramifications are. So let's look at the information hierarchy real quick. Our goal throughout the summer. We're going to look at the information hierarchy real quick, and I think I'll do the Excel thing at the end because. The Excel demonstration is actually, the demonstration I'm going to do is just showing you some of these data types that we talked about. Um, and it's actually going to be the data set that you will use in your assignment next week. You're going to get that um, assignment next week, but this is, um, this, this uh, example is actually just going to kind of show you some of the features and just getting used to some of the capabilities of Excel that we will probably use in that assignment. And I'll go over that assignment next week when, when it's handed out, but not tonight. Our goal throughout the semester is to go from data to information to knowledge. A uh, logical starting point is to say, what's the difference? What is, how do we define data? How do we define information? How do we define knowledge? And the first step is to just, first of all, realize that they're distinctly different things. We're, when we talk about data, it's distinctly different than information, distinctly different than knowledge. So the first part is, let's think about data. I'm going to provide a bit of an analogy. Data is kind of like the raw ingredients of cooking. It's the base, it's the, the starting point, it's the raw materials that you need, right? Just like you have to collect ingredients from a grocery store, you have to collect data somehow. Someone could have collected the data for you, but you'd have to find it, you gotta put it together, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta bring it together. You need those raw ingredient, uh, ingredients. There's techniques for doing this, there's techniques for collecting data, we're gonna examine that. There's different instruments. We also have to look at for problems um, that occur in the data and how to fix them. Okay, so, so this is a very important point because we, we will use this point um, next week when you do your assignment. And there'll be two parts to the assignment. One is creating that Google form and then one is extracting the data from that form and saving it. Um, I'm really just most, probably I'll talk about more next week, but I'm just really more interested that you do the form and get get an idea of, of um, how to create that form it's pretty simple and will be will be directions on how to do it but the point of the form is that third bullet and that is preventing misleading or erroneous data from being entered into the system all right so if you have ever used which i know you know you have uh, a survey tool so if someone has, has ever asked you for a survey Notice how the survey has, it guides you through what it wants from you, what it wants to know from you, but it guides you through that in a way that you must choose from the choices that are, you're, you're given, okay, versus just free for all. Because if a survey was put together and all the question was asked and the answer was given in a free form box, you would have n number of answers possibly, or n number of variations of answers. Almost impossible to analyze, incredibly time consuming, and very difficult to extract information from. So that's one reason why we put together stuff like that and, and give you, give the users or give the, the audience that we want information from, 
only choices from a set of choices that we want to be displayed to them. So user interface forms, forms where you're, you're asked for information. Some fields are required, some are not. Where they're asking for a particular piece of data that's important, you'll probably have seen something like a drop down, or you'll have a date picker where you'll pick the date versus enter it, or you'll have a clicker where you can click through versus you entering in data. Again, it's to force uniformity so that we get a uniform response from the user. That's a very important thing because if you don't do that or where you lack in taking the extra steps to do that, you invariably end up with garbage data or data that ends up not conforming to what you want. So you may end up with a, a numeric or a, uh, a text uh, character in a, in a numeric field or an invalid date or a choice that's not any one of the choices that you wanted. So you put techniques in front of the uh, subject that you're gathering data from so that you can guide them into how the answer should be structured. And that is really the point of that assignment that you're going to get next week in terms of creating the form and analyzing the data that comes from the form. But it all gets around these techniques right here. And it, it drives the, the cleanliness of the data and the ease at which you can analyze it. All right. Inevitably, there's going to be some dirty data, data that is misleading, data that we don't need, data that's not standardized. We're going to look at ways of cleaning that data, just like we would clean, uh, clean the raw ingredients um, in a meal. So we'll look at techniques for cleaning data. We'll understand the risk of not cleaning the data. We'll look at how to identify dirty versus clean data and define that as well. And just as if you would then take those raw ingredients, the data, um, you know, in, in cooking, you would prepare them, right? You would have to prepare what you would need. You're not necessarily going to use a whole carrot. You're using a portion of a carrot for a stew. Um, you have to get it ready. All right, we're going to look at ways of preparing the data, making it ready for analysis, making it ready for processing. And then we're going to add the ingredients together. And we're going to talk about data aggregation is similar to how you would add the ingredients together for, say, making a meal. Data aggregation is reducing the size of the data to answer important questions. Um, typically, if we have, say, uh, 100,000 rows of data, uh, we want to get it down to something that's useful, something that is more condensed, something that's answering specific questions. All right, so we're going to look at that process as well. And we're all doing this because we need to, we want to go from the raw ingredients data to information, to knowledge. So we're going to define those just as if you go from the raw ingredients of a meal um, to being able to actually, you know, the, the raw ingredients to actually producing a, a meal that, that's edible, right? In our case, we're, we're interested in answering questions. We're interested in making informed decisions. And so the first step is to think about this as a continuum. Understanding is a continuum where we have data all the way here at the far left. So let's look at what is data. Well, we, we spoke about it as raw ingredients. Um, you could think of that as, say, temperature data, right? If you're looking at 98.6, 99.5, and you have all this string of different numbers, um, that would be the raw material. Important thing to note is context matters. We need to know the underlying context of how was the data collected? Where was it collected? What was the time that it was collected? We, you know, the numbers themselves don't really mean much unless we have a lot of the underlying surrounding information to be able to put it into a useful um, context. And so remember the user really provides context. The user is the one who's providing a very important role. Data is all collected for a reason. People aren't doing it for fun. They're doing it to solve problems. So understanding of what, why the data was collected is important to understand what use there is for the data. What is the user looking to gain by interacting with the data and using this data, right? So if it's temperature data at the university, right? Someone's using that to make decisions, what to wear, right? What, you know, should you wear a coat today? Should you wear shorts, right? That's useful information given the proper context of when and where the data was collected, or is it forecast data, something that's out there into the future? All right, so important thing is, remember, data is collected for a reason. It's collected because it's trying to solve a problem. You're trying to accomplish something, right? So the purpose of data is to lead to some sort of change or to result in some sort of action, okay? Um, and these 
the, the action and the change can vary dramatically um, through all sorts of complex um, situations. So let's look at how that's different than information. Well, information is, is presenting and organizing the data in such a manner as to create meaning. Um, typically, the raw data by itself can be very difficult to make sense of and use. And when you're interacting with it, you want to be interacting it in some sort of intuitive fashion. So say we take that example of temperature data, and if we look at it in the context of a weather forecasting, right, where we see some sort of organized presentation of the information in this format, we can say, okay, we know the current temperature, we can look at the forecast throughout the day, throughout the week. Um, that's information that becomes useful for making decisions, right? For what to wear, what to expect, you know, making travel plans, et cetera. Right? Remember, without context, it doesn't really mean much. If you just look at the at temperature data, you don't know if it's weather data, you don't know if it's body temperature data, you don't really have any idea of if you don't know when, where it was collected. Um, it doesn't really make any sense. You really can't use it. So it's important to keep in mind the context. Um, if you look at, say, a temperature of 100 degrees, if it's a person's body temperature, they're running a fever, right? If it's a temperature outside in a given day, you know that that's something that maybe is affecting what you're wearing, right? So the decisions that get made, the impact varies dramatically on the context. All right, so let's look at how information is different than knowledge, right? Knowledge is information that can be acted upon, right? You, you have the information presented in such a way that you're able to make an informed decision, right? So you, you're able to have, basically make some sort of analysis and, and this is leading in towards some sort of change, you know, some sort of action, right? A really overly simplified example is what we've kind of mentioned prior, right? If it's 100 degrees outside, right? It's really hot, right? You've identified some context, you've identified um, some sort of decision um, that's hot outside, maybe that's affecting what you're wearing, um, you know, versus if it's 100 degrees outside of your body temperature, you, you know, having the knowledge that, you, that you're running a fever, right? So being able to distill the information into some sort of um, informed action, right? Wisdom is just a distilled, integrated knowledge, a higher level of understanding, okay? Such as, you know, fevers, you go to a doctor, right? These are pretty simple examples, but you can get the, the rough idea. You know, higher level, really, really good decision-making based on an integrated amount of knowledge, okay? Typically, you see these things as a hierarchy where you have data as the raw material. Information is the data organized and presented in a um, particular manner. Knowledge, justified true belief. Information that can be acted upon, right? And wisdom is that detailed, distilled, integrated, high level of understanding. Right? Sometimes referred to as the information hierarchy, right? Where you have data piled at the bottom, stacked upon each level. And really, obviously, you're trying to get towards wisdom, making really good informed decisions. Okay? As you go up the hierarchy, you're getting more uh, refined and abstract, right? Data is very tangible. Um, somebody can look at it and identify that that's the raw ingredients, where when wisdom is something that somebody's now acting upon some sort of information, people might view um, reasonable actions differently. It's a little bit more abstract, harder to find, harder to measure. All right, let's look at a real world example. Uh, years ago, I worked in a, um, a position in which we were uh, making a device uh, that was collecting GPS data and all sorts of sensor data on tractor trailers. Um, and so you can think of the data as in its most basic form as tracking in space and time uh, vehicles throughout the country, right? So you're getting that, that's the raw data that's coming off of the device. Um, and you could present that information in the most basic way of basically plop, plopping the location of the trucks over time throughout um, on a map, right? So that's the information is the presentation of that information presented in a lot of different ways, right? Let's think of how that, what kind of decisions that can be made from that, right? From having potentially hundreds of thousands of trucks being tracked in real time around the country with all sorts of different sensors equipped, knowing if there's uh, cargo in the back, knowing if the door is open, all sorts of uh, information. Well, that knowledge is pretty powerful, right? You can do some very integrated supply chain tracking applications in which you're doing smart routing, right? Making it where they're picking up deliveries in the most optimal way, reducing gas consumption, you know, knowing how you can basically um, make predictions on where there might be end up being 
delays or bottlenecks in supply chain, trying to look at even conge a congestion prediction, trying to avoid certain routes, improving safety is certain drivers acting very uh, carelessly and, and potential to cause an accident, right? So being able to take that basic data of just some spatial temporal information coming off of device and being able to use that to, um, you know, basically make all sorts of predictions and all sorts of analysis, right? Make informed decisions, that'd be an example of knowledge. Right? We'll gain some practice throughout um, in the class over the next couple of weeks. Each level and really obviously. Okay, so a lot packed into that uh, is it a 10 minute, yeah, 10 minute uh, video. Lots, lots of important stuff, a lot of important concepts packed in there. Probably the, one of the more important ones is this particular slide right here. So this ends up becoming the foundation, if you will, for data analytics, data science, informatics. It's being able to take all of the ton is probably the wrong word for it, but gigabytes and thousands and tens of thousands of transactions and terabytes of data, gathering that data, running it through analysis to get information. Well, getting information that allows you to have knowledge, which then you can act upon. And that, that is the, one of the keys that, that Professor Muckle kind of talked about in the knowledge section. The knowledge section is taking all of that data you've got, and I'm gonna go over kind of an example in a second. I don't know if I can find the chart. Um, I'll try to find the chart next time. Um, the Taking the data, processing the data to get information from it, using that information for knowledge, which then you can action, and then wisdom is the fact that now you've got that data set or you've got that knowledge and that information, you can then use that in the future for prediction or measuring yourself against the continuous, the measuring yourself in the future against what you know now to be the state that you want. Now, what's, what's an example of that? Um, and again, I'm not gonna test you on this kind of stuff, but control chart, we'll use a control chart for, in, for instance. In a control chart, we have what are called specification limits, lower and upper. So let's say that we are a, um, we're a big Fortune 100 company, and we want to maximize our cash. And one of the ways that we can maximize our cash, make it work very, very hard for us, is that we hold on to our cash for paying our payables as late as possible without getting penalized by our vendor, okay? And based on all of our transactions that we've got, we found that given the time it takes to process a payment to a vendor to get paid in time so that we don't incur the penalty has a plus or minus day or two uh, leeway on it. What we found out is that if we begin on the lower end, depending on if it's a mail, we have to mail it or overnight it or EFT it, There'll be different times at which we process. So we found from our data that our ultimate time where we are holding our cash to the last possible minute without incurring penalty is on a lower number of 10 days and an upper limit of 20 days. So anywhere in between 10 and 20 days are the maximum amount of time where we start our payment and make sure that it re arrives there in 20 days. So we start our payment anywhere between 10 and 20 days, depending on how they're paid. If they're paid paper, it's a 10 day. If they're paid in EFT, it's 20 days. So we found that, again, the data showed us that the maximum or the minimum is 10 days that we want to wait and the maximum is 20 days. So any time you schedule a payment within the 10 to 20 day window is the most opportune use of having your cash in the bank or wherever it is sitting to maximize your uh, maximize your use of it and holding that cash without being penalized, being penalized by your vendor. 
So that 10 is the lower limit, the 20 is the upper limit. Any values in the middle there are perfect. So what a control chart does show you is that anything that is above that or below that are not optimal scenarios for you. So whenever that thing happens, whenever it's below or above, you want to find out what was the cause of that happening. Now that that's a rough example of a control chart. And what that does is gives us knowledge and then wisdom for the future, all right? So now we can continuously monitor our payment systems to make sure that we are in that 10, 10 to 20 day uh, window. So we've gone from, now if you're a big Fortune 100 company and you've got billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars, that could add up. I mean, those are, those are that's real money for a company. So those are actionable decisions we can make based on the data and based on the information that we get from our data. And now we've got wisdom in the future. Let's monitor all of our payments to make sure they're in between that 10 to 20 days so we can now be smart about the future and how we deal with this. All right. That's an example. Another example I was going to show you, which is it's harder to show, but I'm going to see if I can find it for next time. It's what's called RFM analysis. Has anybody ever heard of RFM analysis? RFM recency frequency in money and it's a technique that companies can use to determine the the amount and i'm going to say this the right way the amount of effort i guess is probably the word for it that a company's sales team may spend on a particular client so if you are so typically the scale is one to five so five meaning uh, um, lowest, in, or I'm sorry, one being the lowest, five being the highest. So one to five, uh, one being the lowest, five being the highest. Recency, frequency, and money. If you, so a sales organization may do an analysis, a report on their data, and get information on an RFM for a particular customer base. They may find that some of their clients are a one in, in, recency, a two in frequency, and a two in money. Well, what does that mean? They haven't bought often, or they, they haven't bought recently, as a one. They haven't bought, they don't buy often, that's the frequency. And two, they don't spend a lot of money. So they may not be a high frequency, so they may not be a high value client, and you still want to keep them, but you may not want to send a delegate team out to go visit them and spend a ton of money on travel and living. You then have a customer who is a three on recency, a three on frequency, and a three on money. Well, threes through a five is a pretty average customer. Those are the ones you can kind of continuously expect. They'll buy from you and they spend decent and then they do it often. So those are the ones you're going to want to keep. They may not be the ones that um, will really move your needle much, but you need them for cash flow. Then you've got a, a one on recency. You've got a five on frequency and a five on money. So a one on recency, they haven't bought lately, a five on frequency, they buy often or they bought often, and a five on money, they spend above average all right that is typically a customer of yours that you're going to want to pick the phone up and call them make sure they're happy why they haven't bought recently they got a one in the recency they're a five in frequency because they've been a purchaser of your your stuff quite frequently and they spend a lot of money that is a customer you do not want to lose so that would be where you pick a phone call up or you send a delegation out to go and meet them. Make sure you don't lose that account. All right. That's another example of how we take data and get to wisdom. All right. That's, that's key. Very, very key. That's sort of the, you know, a use case for analytics and a use case for informatics. And, and there's just countless number of examples, but that is the model by how we get from the bottom to the top and the top is where we want to be. The smarter we are, the better. That's why a lot of companies these days have entire organizations that are business analytics um, organizations or business intelligence organizations. That's what they do. They are looking for these kinds of things. They put together the tools management can look and really probe and understand what their business is doing. Because if you're a more or less a digital organization, you're not going to see this stuff unless you process the data. 
right? You're not going to see it, especially if you're um, in, 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 you don't want to see it at the end of the quarter when accounting is being done and all of a sudden you've missed an entire quarter and for no explanation. And then you got to go backtrack and figure out well, why did we miss the quarter? Well, we missed the quarter because we didn't get all these sales. Why didn't get it? we get all these sales? I don't know. You got to figure it out. Well, if we have these kinds of tools and have that approach, uh, we don't let that kind of stuff happen. All right. So that is a, again, a lot in this, and it looks pretty straightforward and pretty simple, but it's very profound because it's very powerful. It's a, it's a, it's a recipe, if you will, to follow. Um, and that's how analytics is done. All right. So that was the information hierarchy. Yes, I, that's, that's the one I wanted to um, I wanted to show you. So what I'm going to do, what I want to show you now is, um, again, this link, I'm going to find out where the right link is. But I want to show you real quick within, uh, this is one technique. Now, I, I, this technique does work. And this approach does work. I'm going to see if there's a simpler way as well um, uh, that ITS has for installing Excel. They probably have a real quick and easy link. But one of the ways that you could actually install Excel very easy is by you is by going into your Office 365 Outlook account. If I click over to my mail, which is my Office 365, and I click on my account, so click on my email or yeah, my Outlook account. Click on your, your picture or your icon and, and choose view account. You're going to get this screen right here. Now, this screen's changed a little bit, but um, essentially what you want to do is you want to go down to my subscriptions. And in the subscriptions, you're going to see the upper left here where it says office apps in devices. This install office right here, that link right there, will guide you through the installation of the office suite down to your device. And again, I, I'm not, I can't remember if, let's see what it does. I can't remember if they give you the option of what, they might during the install. Set up. So I can't. I'm not an admin on this PC, so I can't install it. Um, but you should be an admin on your own PC, administrator. Um, it may give you the option to install just Excel. In other words, you may be able to uncheck some things. I don't remember if it, in the past it did. Now I was told last semester it didn't. It just installed the entire office, which is Word, PowerPoint, Excel, um, I think Publisher. One note and a couple of other tools that you, you may or may not use. Um, so that is the way to get uh, Excel down to your device so that when you do these assignments, you're going to have the full and complete version of Excel on your device and not have to use the online version. Because again, the online version doesn't have some of these capabilities that we're going to use. It would probably work for the first assignment, but it won't work for the subsequent assignments because we're going to do some um, complex graphing and, and, and charting and things like that. And, and we're actually going to do this thing called a pivot table, which is a super important uh, tool within Excel. And I don't believe the online version has that either. So that's, uh, that's the easy way to do it. Again, I think I'll look and see if ITS has a better link. They might. There may be a different link that you go to, but that, that definitely works for getting um, Office installed on your PC. Okay, so this file is essentially this, this Excel demonstration file right there. All right, and I'm going to do a few things in 
in the Excel file just to kind of demonstrate some of these data types. Um, I also did that and then some other kinds of editing of that data file in that second link called Excel demonstration file edit in class. So rather than, you know, having you to do it, it's, it's already there edited. So it shows you some of the things that I've done to, to, to give you a, an idea of the data types. This file, if you download it again next week, will be the basis for your assignment next week. Now, I'll go over this a little bit more next week, but we're going to manipulate some of this data in here in the assignment to kind of clean it up. We're going to do some of that cleansing that uh, we saw in the video. Um, for instance, you can see here, there's no last name for that entry right there. And the point of this is to show you that when you don't put good editing controls in place, you end up getting data that is not clean. So this is a, was um, a form created that allowed a lot of stuff to get put in and didn't guide the user or the user of the, of the form into putting in what was appropriate for each of these data fields. So you end up with, with garbage in there. So next week's assignment will be to fix some of this um, dirty data and there'll be, ton, there'll be instructions in it and we'll, we'll kind of review it next week. But um, this is essentially what the, um, the data will be. I want to show you a few things in here though, just to kind of demonstrate our, our data types. So notice the phone number here, um, the phone number field. Now, most of the time, you're not going to do any kind of mathematics or computations on a phone number, so you don't necessarily need to make it a numeric field, but it's fine that you, if you do, all right? You could always format it um, in a way that would make it look more like a phone number, because unless you knew this was a phone number, you'd look at those numbers and go, well, what are they? All right? And that gets into that whole context. What's the data? What is this? If I didn't have anything here, this was gone, you'd look at that and if I asked you what it was, you'd be like, I have no idea. It's just a bunch of numbers. And that's true. So this is phone numbers. Now, notice that the phone number entered as a number all numbers, justifies to the right. In other words, the numbers are all sitting, starting at the right. right. That's the case with numeric values in most software, definitely including Excel, where it right justifies numbers. Notice this text chicken, all right? It's text. That is left justified, and that is the typical way text values are entered. Now, if I said, okay, meal choice can have uh, alpha numeric, meaning it can have numbers in it as well, and we've got this really cool chicken dish called chicken 445. Now I've got text and numbers in it but yet it still left justifies it. Why? Because the text is in there. So it says, all right, I'm treating all of this as text. I can't do any mathematics on that field. Now, if I decided, okay, I want my phone number. I don't know why I got phone number short. Um, well, that's part of the assignment, I think. If I wanted my phone number to be a little bit more formatted, and I did um, 531, 355, 1901, now it looks more like a phone number. Look what it does to it. It moves it to the left. Why? Because now I've just introduced non-numeric characters to it, right? alpha, alpha characters in there with the, with the parentheses and the dash. And now it says, okay, you are now a text field. Right. So, examples of how the software understands what it's reading and says, makes a decision upon how it's going to how it's going to treat that information. Um, 
Um, I could literally, and this doesn't make a lot of sense, I could take these two, three numbers right here and just highlight them. Now it's probably hard to see, but right down here, those are numbers. You can get Excel to do some quick calculations for you. So Excel summed those numbers. It counted the numbers that I've highlighted and it did an average of those numbers. It's a, called a quick, cal quick calculation. And it does it because those are numbers, right? So there's, these are more basic kinds of things that we're gonna wanna be able to do inside of our Excel workbook. Now, oh, okay. Um, and I'm just gonna jump over real quick to This is the edited sheet. So I've added a logical field called logical registration. Now, how did I do that? Well, I simply clicked on the column, the entire column by clicking on the letter. And again, we talked a little earlier that all of the columns are A through Z and all of the rows are numbers. So if you look here, in the upper left information box, you see this G2 here. That is Excel telling you that you are currently highlighting cell G2. Well, how do we get G2? Well, it's column row. Column G, row two. So G2 is the cell that I'm currently highlighting. If I wanted to do, let's say I need to insert some data in here now. I want to add, what did I do this one? In between email and meal choice. So if I wanted to insert a column of data in here and I wanted to be able to key in some new data, I can insert an entire new column, shift everything over by one. To do that, I just highlight the entire column that I want. Now, if you're not on the home tab, which is the, the, there's a bunch of tabs across the top, and you can do all sorts of things to your spreadsheet. If you're not on the home tab, click on home, and then click on insert. Now, if I just clicked on, I, I clicked on the, the drop down arrow there, which gave me the choices that I can do here. If I clicked on just the insert, it would say, oh, you've highlighted a column, you want to insert a column. So it's going to try to make that decision for you, giving you one less keystroke. But I clicked on that drop down arrow, and it turns out that I do want to insert a column, sheet column. So I'm just going to click on that. And now I have a new column where I can enter some data. Okay, so we still have A, B, C, D, E, F, G all the way throughout the alphabet, but now everything is shifted over one but now I have the ability to enter some data into column G. Now I think what I did on the other spreadsheet, as I said, logical. And the only reason why I did that is just so that you could see that the logical data type is a true false data type. So, so. And notice too what it does to the logical pieces. Give you a little bit of a distinction, and it centers those. All right, so it says, hey, you know what? That's a different kind of data type. It's not a text data type, it's a logical data type. So I'm going to make it look just a little bit different and stand it out just a hair for you. Right, so those are very simple. Um, a simple data field. Now that could be something as simple as, this could let's say web registration. Now, one of the easy ways, there's a couple of ways to actually edit this field. I'm gonna change G1, notice now this is G1. 
I'm going to change, I want to change that text. I want to say not logical registration, but I want to say web registration. So let's say you could have registered on the web or you could have phoned in your registration for this, for this conference. So I'm going to change that a couple ways of doing it. I can double click inside G1, highlight the text, type web. Or I could press the F2 key on my keyboard and you notice the cursor is blinking at the end of registration. I can go over and change any values I want. Or I can come up here on the formula bar and do the same thing. So there's lots of different ways to edit that column or, any, or edit any cell. Right? So double clicking is the easiest probably, but you can press F2 if you'd like, or you can change it in the uh, formula bar. Right. Now here we've got, um, so this might be an application where we want to count up the number of people who registered on the web. It would be very easy to do that. We'll, we'll see some techniques um, beginning, beginning next week anyway um, for how you can actually do those kinds of things. Um, so there's our um, there's a logical one other data type that I want to show you which is, wasn't important. Um, I'll do it out here. Call it date of reg. And here I'm going to put in a date. Now I'm going to I'm more really concerned about the date and not the date and the time, although we could capture that if we wanted to. Um, this could have, this data, this data uh, could have been generated from a web form where the web form actually captures that date and you could actually get the time on there to know when people registered. So you can get some analytics to say, hey, when did people register? Were they registering ahead of time for this thing or did they register like a last minute for this thing? Was there anybody that registered after the registration period, just all sorts of data that you, you know, all sorts of information that you can gather uh, based on that. So let's put a date in. Let's do 03, uh, now we've got the date in the format that I entered it in. Now, I could change that to practically any format that I want. One of the easiest ways to do it is to highlight it, right click, and click format cell. I'm a big fan of the right click menu. Why? Because they're very short and very quick. They give you the Excel smart about when you right click on a cell, what things can you do there? Not is everything under the sun available? No, it's not. So it gives you a short list of things that you can actually do there. Knows automatically, hey, that looks pretty much like a date to me. It gives you the ability to format the date in the way that you'd like to format it. A lot of different ways of doing it. You can change it to pretty much any international format. You can change it to a long format, or I could change it to the date, year, month, day format, all right? Still the same date, but now it's just in a different format. Right. So I can come down here, type in a new date. And Excel says, huh, I don't recognize that date, so it can't be a date. It's going to be text. All right. So there's an instance where I entered in a date of 333.21, and it's saying, hey, it's not a date. So I'm not going to give, you, give it to you as a date, and I'm not going to give you the ability to format that as a date. All right. So it's, it's just, at that point, it's just text, characters, alphanumeric. And that's the one thing that Excel is very, very good at. It's very, very good at allowing pretty much anything you want to put into a cell, it'll accept it. 
So in that case, it's alphanumeric. So it's saying you got numbers in there, you got a slash in there, you probably can put text in there too if you want. Now I'm going to call it an alphanumeric. Alphanumeric and text are pretty much the same thing. Um, Excel's perspective. So now it's saying, ah, you had an alpha field, none of that stuff is of any type other than just straight characters. And the date is something valid and says, you know what, that looks like a date to me, I'm going to give you the date for that. So these are some of the very important key data types within Excel. There's, there are others like we, we talked about, but we're really only concerned about these most important ones. Um, here, this, as I was talking earlier, is an example. Now what I'm clicking on down here is the zoom. So I can actually increase the size of this worksheet or decrease the size of the worksheet. Here's the example that I was talking about earlier where the form could actually capture what's called the timestamp. Now that's a very common thing to do in any analytics or any software tools. Do a, um, a, a some, some call it a date timestamp, but most of the time it's called a timestamp. And basically what that does is that says, hey, this was created at this point in time. Now, it looks like the vast majority of those were created about the same time, but you could actually use that uh, timestamp information. Again, because the word um, timestamp is in here, that indicates uh, not only do we want the date in there, but we also want the time. So we've got the time, we've got the date of 12-28-2014, and in, in um, 24 hour format, 2147.45, so 947.45 um, in 24 hour format. And again, you can also, if you see it, see it right justified the way it is, Excel looks at that and says, hey, I know what that is. That looks like a date time to me. So I have the ability to format that as well. All right. And now, that data was created with a custom time format on it. Now, we're not gonna to deal too much with custom. You, you literally could customize practically any uh, numeric field. You can, you can customize a lot of fields in Excel using this custom option, and these are all the different custom format types that they have available. We're not gonna to play too much with those. I don't think we're gonna deal with them a lot, um, but they do exist, and they do give you a lot of capability in terms of the way you wanna show that information. So very important, um, very important in the way we, uh, we use that. Now I want to show you one other thing because we're going to use it, and I want to give you the heads up on this. The instructions in some cases will ask you to filter your data. All right, so filtering gives you the ability, and I'll just click on it so you can see what it does. So filtering is found under the data tab, and it's this, which looks like a filter, all right, icon. You click on it, and what it does is it gives you the ability to filter on every single one of those rows, okay, every single one of those rows. So I could come over here and click on the drop down and it gives me a list of values that are found in that column. So what filter does is it looks at the entire column and says, what are, what are the values in here? Okay. There's a finite number of values because it's a set of data. So the data ends at some point. So let's say I wanted to look just at chicken. So I want to just see the, the, the chicken entries. So I can click, unclick, select all. Now, gets rid of all the choices, and I can click on just chicken, and now I see only the rows that have chicken in it. There's no choice for chicken. 
Notice on the very far left, of the number that I've satisfied that condition. So this ends up being 209 of 324 are chicken. So that's one way of knowing um, how to, it's one way of counting, but it's a manual way of counting. If there was other things you wanted to count on there, you'd have to do them individually. So it is a good, um, you, it is a good use, it's a good tool, um, because maybe you want to see those, that set of values and maybe you want to do some manipulation there, but you really don't want to rely on it for a counting mechanism because right? there are other automated ways of counting, which we're going we're gonna to learn about in the pivot table next week. But um, it is one of the options. Now, in your assignment, you're going to be told to do some filtering because I think you're going to filter And you're going to, in your assignment, you're going to fix the blanks. You're going to put in, I think it says no email, I think is what you put in here. So, no email. All right, so that's a good use of filter. All right. So that's an example. Now, the assignment is also going to tell you to then create a pivot table from that data set. Whenever you create a pivot table, and you're here to hear the benefit of this because there's been a lot of mistakes made in the past in it, you want to pivot on all of your data, which means you want to remove your filter. Always remove that filter before you do the pivot. And again, I'll talk about it next week and remind you, but now you have the advanced knowledge and understanding that when you ever you're going to do your pivot, you're going to pivot on your entire data set, which means you don't want to filter that data out because then you're only going to pivot on the filtered piece of that data. It's not going to give you the big picture of your data set. You want to remove that filter. All right. So those are some highlighted, again, I'm not going to throw a ton of Excel stuff at you. Right now, we're going to do little bits of new stuff as we need it. So this is a good understanding. And again, I'll, I'll probably cover a little bit more next week on cleaning of data uh, to get you started on for that next assignment. So little bits of, of, uh, of, of understanding of, of how to use this tool and how to use it to get, um, to get information out of it. And then the following week, we'll learn a little bit more and then a little bit more and a little bit more to the point where, you know, it, it'll be a fairly decent um, analytics tool. You can see kind of just the beginning introduction of, of the power of these kinds of tools and what kinds of manipulation you can do on your data. Again, if you've run across research where there's, there is data referenced in tables or graphs or whatever, they've done this. They may not have done it in Excel. They may have used R. They may have used Python. Maybe they did in Excel. Um, but they've done it in a way that you know, aggregates probably tens of thousands of rows of data. We're only gonna work with 300 or so rows of data, but they've probably aggregated tens of thousands of data. And that's the point of these tools is that you can't make heads or tails out of that raw data the way it is. And that was the point that Professor Muckle was making in his video. That's why we use tools like this in, in techniques to then make sense of this data. If, you ask, if I asked you right now, um, How many, uh, how many people on the first day uh, ordered meal, uh, ordered chicken or vegetarian on the first day? That is not an easy thing to do by that raw data right there. But using a tool like pivot table, which we're gonna learn next week, you can answer that in a second. So we create our pivot table and boom, the data's right there. Here, this would take you, so what do you wanna know now? I wanna know who ordered vegetarian or chicken on the first day. So that is an important piece of information for the cook who has to now pre prepare all this stuff for the, um, the seminar.
questions on that? Very uh, introductory yet practical ways of using data for analytics and informatics in a way that we can uh, make sense of our raw data to make decisions and uh, get some knowledge. So we're going to use a very fairly, uh, it's a pretty simplistic example, but yet still representative of the kind of technique that you would go through in order to do that. All right. Straightforward. Any questions on any of the high level concepts that we talked about tonight? That one uh, pyramid is a very important pyramid. You will be asked for sure, guaranteed, about that pyramid on your exam number two. That's a key topic. Questions? No questions? All right. So next week we'll pick up um, with our next set of uh, data analytics techniques using Excel. We'll do some, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the assignment next week, and then you'll have the assignment assigned to you to work on for the following week. Then we'll talk about cleaning up some data and techniques within Excel to do that stuff as well. All right. If you have questions on, again, going forward, if you have questions on any of this, you'll reach out to your TA, myself, or ask a question um, when you begin doing these assignments. All right. We'll see you next week.